Hello everybody, hopefully you can see uh, me here. It's Annie Gibbons here from Glaucoma Australia and today I have the delight of interviewing optometrist from Hobart, Matt Bennett. Welcome Matt. Good evening, how are you? Good, thank you. Today we are going to be just chatting about visual field tests. They're one of those uh, uh, frustrating parts of having glaucoma. No one seems to like the visual field. Uh, so how about you start uh, telling me pretty much mm -hmm. and those who are uh, listening in, what are visual fields? Why do we actually have visual fields? Basically, the visual fields test is a, a modern evolution of a process where we can check what's happening in your peripheral vision um, because we use in everyday life, we mainly use the central vision macula and uh, we're not that aware of whether we're missing things in the peripheral vision. As a lot of people might know, we already have two blind spots, one in each eye where the optic nerve leaves and goes to the brain and mm -hmm. so I tend to say to a lot of patients you know you've got quite an enlarged little blind spot there already that you're completely unaware of and mm. I'll often demonstrate with a piece of paper and a few dots ah. and make it disappear yeah. and so if you're not aware of that rather large blind spot in each eye I'm not sure why people think they'll they'll be aware of if they're missing you know, quite an area of their vision so a fields test is a structured test to shine lights in your peripheral vision and have you hit a button uh, when you see them and it tests how sensitive you are in various areas of your peripheral vision. Mm. So it's like you sit in the dark yeah. and, and hit your button with a fire patch <laughs> and um, get bored. And I think the hardest thing is that you have to look straight ahead at a central target while being aware of the spot. You know, you're tempted to look around at the uh, flashing light. Yes, that's it. So that brings us on to another point, and I'll come back to what you said then. Is that people say uh, some um, doctors say that you take you you improve at the visual field the more you do, which is a weird thing. It's kind of like not like a game, but obviously the way you look and you focus on what you're trying to see, you do actually get uh, better at it. Is that right? That, that, that is true. Uh, I think your second or third test for most people is. Um, the most accurate as a baseline to compare all your future testing against. And um, that, that we call that the practice effect. And so you will notice that some people are, are a little bit keen to do well when they first do it. They're a bit trigger happy. Mm -hmm. um, but what we, I think it's really important to, uh, we, we can be in a bit of a rush in, in practice these days trying to do as much good for as many people as we can. But, forget the, the benefit of a really good set of clear instructions the first time someone encounters mm. this. Mm. And so if you uh, you stress the importance of uh, remaining still, having your central vision fixated on the required target, tell them that there's probably going to be 40 or 50% of the lights that they won't see because the <laughs> whole idea of this machine is to work out what we call the threshold of their vision at each point. So if you take a particular point out in your right visual field, it's trying to work out how faint it can get away before you stop reporting that you're seeing it mm. and comparing that to everyone else your age. And so there will be a lot of points missed if you do the test correctly. So, you know, the, the desire to do well <laughs> can get them a bit, a bit keen. Um, yeah. But no, I, I think you get right two or three tests and then we're off and running. Mm. I think that's an amazing um, point that you, you said that that's right, we already have uh, a blind spot and we were, you know, I have one and I don't have glaucoma, but I don't think that I'm missing any vision. So it is that constant weird feeling of, well, why do they have to check if I'm losing, losing vision? Surely I would have noticed, whereas that's exactly right. There's quite a lot um, of vision that you could be losing without you being aware of that. And I also stress that it's not, I think one of the reasons patients perhaps think that I'll be aware of it is so your brain doesn't paint a black hole there. Mm. To you know, It's just, there's nothing there. And, and the brain um, extrapolates and fills in 
the gap, just like it does with your natural blind spot. And so you can be missing quite a, an, a large area without the slightest clue. Mm. Um, and that seems at odds with what patients believe. Yeah. Uh, but you can... We've got a question here from one of the listeners in, um, is there a specific visual field test for kids? Do they use the same machine or do they have a different machine? With kids, it depends how old they are. We don't really um, use it a lot on children, A, because um, they're not a cohort that you're worried about glaucoma in. Most people are over 30 or 40. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will... A very quick version of it that you might remember from watching uh, the VR or something is that, you know, look at my nose and can you see my fingers? Yeah. Going here, here and uh, that's called a confrontation in visual field test. If done properly, you can get a, a sort of a gross picture of if there's any abnormality there. But, but A, you're not needing to check children by and large uh, unless if they've got childhood glaucoma, it's normally evident. Yeah. Um, as a congenital defect, you know, when they're born. Um, and you don't. You know, you can hardly get a six-year-old boy to sit still and read the chart, let alone... <laughs> That's like, exactly put right. His, put his chin up here and sit for five minutes per eye, which used to be 15 minutes per eye. Yeah, um, which is good to know that you can get around that. As a practitioner, you go, rather than make it a very stressful experience that the poor child can't sit there that time and is then going to muck it up anyway, you can get around it by doing, you know, an old-fashioned manual test, if you like, uh, to be yeah. able to get very, you know, you know, not perfect yeah. results, but... but be- yeah, adaptable, yeah. <laughs> the other thing I've seen there working on, I don't know how far along they are, is a, um, a, an objective visual field as opposed to a subjective. When, when someone's doing a test for you and reporting what they're seeing, mm-hmm. you're relying on them. Yes. But, so so that, that's a subjective test where they, they have to give you some information and they're, they're working on developing visual field machines that shine lights all over the retina and look for a pupil response that can objectively tell quickly whether um, those nerves are working without asking the patient anything and get it done quite quick. That would be useful for children, but it, technology in development and it's not I know oh it's so exciting seeing what can happen in the in the in the future and maybe near future you know even being able to use you know AI goggles and being able to just watch a movie and it being able to record well what could you see and what couldn't you see depending on how your eye moves things like that are all just in the future aren't they and so hopefully this visual field machine um, won't be there forever in that thing what about people who talk about different time frame, time requirements? There's obviously quick visual fields and then there's ones that take a lot longer. Is that just a brand thing? Is there a big difference in the, the quality of what's achieved in that test? Look, when I was at university, mid-90s, it was up to 15 minutes per eye, 16 minutes per eye, and they found that that was actually detrimental to the reliability. It took that long with the old software and the old machines to go back to the number of points they wanted to test. But the tests have come down um, to around, you know, some very good observers can get a three and a half you know, test done in each eye and it will be over with. But it's normally about four or five minutes um, mm. per eye for most people, which is a huge improvement. Massive, um, massive improvement. I mean, go back 60, 70 years, you were standing waving your wand in front of the black belt screen. <laughs> Brain, yeah, as you as you'll be aware, yeah, so it's, it's come a long way, and there are you can apply um, if you're concerned about the patient testing and the speed, you can apply a slightly faster version of the, the test where the reliability varies, but it can get some information if you've got a, a, a poor observer. Test, yeah, you know. yeah. There's a question here from Nathan that says he knows that he misses a lot of things when he does the visual field test. So how does the optometrist determine the re- reliability of those results? We actually have reliability indices. Or oh, index, okay. Indexes, um, at, on the top of, yeah, you'll get, you'll get a printout of a visual field, something like this. Yeah. When you're finished. And it'll tell us um, how many false positives and false negatives so how many times did you hit the button when they actually say shine a light in your blind spot where you shouldn't even see it? Right, um, okay. How many times did you not hit your button when you'd already said you could see that light in that same position a minute earlier? 
Um, yeah. So one would be one you should be seeing again, uh, and one would be one there's no way you should be seeing. And so it does a set number of those thrown in there to give a percentage reliability on our test, and we can be fairly sure. The other thing, the, the eyes monitor with the camera, uh, your your eye and where it's looking is monitored the whole time, and the operator, which isn't always the optometrist, I must mm. say, it's often um, a, a, a equipment, uh, a technician that'll uh, uh, do the test for you, um, and they can see uh, your eye and what it's doing, and are very quickly on to someone who's sort of, you know, all, all over the place <laughs> uh, during the test, I <laughs> and they'll stop and start again with some new instructions, and, and some people, you know, the eye is not naturally evolved to remain staring at one thing that's why this is so difficult yeah um, it's designed to, to slightly move its fixation position to keep refreshing the image like a computer screen mm. and if you know uh, i've said to patients before if you held an eye still in a vice by about five or ten second mark there would be no image it fades out yeah so, okay so the eye's designed to move around and refresh and it's attempting to Okay, uh, so those patients who are saying, yes, I actually find it tiring. I find it, it's, you know, quite stressful. It's understandable then because you're actually putting yourself through a, a bit of an experience that isn't natural, isn't, you know, designed to be enjoyable. It's actually um, a little bit longer than, you know, depending on which, which type of machine you've had, then you do generally find tolerable but necessary. And I also heard you say there that it seems like it tests the same thing two or three different times just to confirm that the, the result given was actually correct. And if you've got different irregularities, it would be deemed not not successful and, and it wouldn't be yeah. used uh, to and, and further. Like you said, I, I think the, the instruction to the patient is important. And I heard, and it, um, I don't know if you've heard, one of the American ophthalmologists talks about comparing it to weight lifting. Mm -hmm. you know, we're literally, you know, anyone can pick up a five pound bar but we're taking you up to where you hit your threshold and can hardly lift it anymore and then testing you just a bit more weight than you can handle, a bit less. Mm. And so it's going to annoy you. It's going to be right at your threshold. Did I see it? Did I not see it? And mm. um, just like having the weightlifting test to find out where, you, where your peak is, um, it is going to be a little bit frustrating. But And that, that's why Nathan should be reassured that if he is feeling like he's missing a lot of them, um, that's if the reliability indices are good that's good he he will hopefully have that number that are below what he can theoretically see mm, terrific that's not you should worry about all right um if you've had a visual field and it just didn't work for another reason should you just have a break for a while and then still have it that same day or should you come back the next day doesn't make any difference the different schools are thought on this i i certainly get Get them to have two goes. If they seem unreliable or there's a big learning effect on their first go, we can try again. Mm -hmm. um, but if maybe on the other eye, but if it seems like you're getting nowhere, it's best to definitely do it on a different day, I find, anyway, to um, bring them back, give them time to think about what it was all about, come back refreshed, potentially after a, a you know, good sleep um, mm. and, and in a better mood or whatever. So mm. that's not uncommon at all. Um, same as trying to teach someone to put a contact lens in. If it's not going anywhere, you're just getting a red eye. You do it another day. <laughs> Give the patient, you know. Fair enough. Breathe again. Yeah. Thank you. We've just had a request just for you to speak a little bit louder, if possible. I always tend to speak loud, so um, I'm probably drowning you out. Sorry about that. Uh, we've got one question saying that the OCT seems to be so much quicker than a visual field, so can't the eye health care professional monitor the glaucoma just with the OCT? That's a very good question because this new technology, the OCT, does give us important measurements that are relevant to glaucoma. But you've got to, with glaucoma, you've got to separate the structure from the function. So your OCT is a measurement of the thickness of your nerve fibres, like measuring the thickness of your electrical cord, how many fibres are, are successfully, you know, running running power through them. So the OCT takes very careful measurement of the thickness of your optic fibres at specific important points, and it compares them to everyone else your age. So that gives an indication if you might be a bit low, mm -hmm. but that's testing structure. 
And then you've got to see if there's a corresponding loss in function and the visual field is the tester of your visual function and how you're performing at each of those points. And one of the most important things is to get a match between um, structure and function. And that, that that's a big clue that you're getting somewhere with your diagnosis. Because glaucoma is notoriously difficult to have even mm. a firm definition, let alone a diagnosis. There's a lot of variation in whether you've got high pressure or normal pressure or yes. um, uh, you know, family history that is relevant. So it, it's a very good question, but they're, too, they're testing two slightly different things. Yeah. And we use the, the collaboration of those two bits of information to make a really much better informed decision. Mm. During the Thank you for that. One of the listeners is saying that her mother is 90 and finds it hard to sit and do the visual field test due to a bad back. Do you have many people who have that situation and how do you manage that? Yeah, we do. Um, it's quite, you know, it's quite common. And this is where clinical decision making comes in as to is it someone who um, is 90 and is perhaps you're slightly suspect about having glaucoma or is it someone who's had it for 60 years and is on the last quarter of their visual field as to how important the information is. Now, if you have someone who is, is managing well and still able to live at home and is just a suspect and unable to do the test well, well, I, I tend not to see when of putting them through or can be, you know, a very frustrating test mm. every year or two. Have a go at it, see if you can get some information. Monitor their OCT mm -hmm. over time and their pressures. And um, if you are really worried, then perhaps refer mm. to an ophthalmologist and seek their opinion because they'll, again, see a much higher proportion of patients that have diagnosed glaucoma than us just mm. screening people for mm. it. But, yeah, I, I think... In a lot of the lectures we watched on this, you know, when you're learning about your, your therapeutic treatments, you, you have to weigh up cost-benefit analysis of what you're doing mm. and how does it benefit the patient, not just you and your seeking of information with your, you know, uh, sort of laser beam <laughs> on diagnosis. It's got to be relevant to their, to their lifestyle. And Oh, absolutely, man. I'm glad to hear you say that because we're all about patient-centred care and making sure that that's right. You know, certainly don't want to be a distressing situation. We just want the best the best outcome on any show, day. But, you know, and definitely it's, maybe it's bring a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. If you have to walk in, everybody, and bring a pillow with you just to get through, hey, I say do, do what works for you, right? Now, you mentioned before that people come, you know, one once or tw one a yearly or every two years. Some people are going, you know, six monthly. Why is there a variation uh, with how often people have to come? Well, that, that will be entirely dependent on what results you're getting from um, the other measurements you're doing, your, your pressure, your performance on that particular visual field um, and how aggressive, you know, family history is. So we'll make a decision based on a number of factors as to whether you're at quite a risk of losing. People who do have glaucoma lose um, a certain percentage annually over their life without treatment. And so if you're sus suspecting that you might have to give an aggressive treatment, um, you might be testing them at more regular intervals um, to just be sure that you're mm. not missing um, a big change over a short period of time, which is not common. Yeah. Um, but most people, if if they just have their normal two yearly tests and there's and you're not concerned about glaucoma, that's fine. If we are worried about the OCT images, we'll definitely um, do a visual field every year. Mm. Patients reliable at doing it. But yeah, someone who's proving to be um, someone you might lose a bit of sleep over, you would you would definitely have with them six monthly. That's covered by Medicare, so we. Yeah. It doesn't cost you anything extra to do the, the extra test per year. It's just us being a bit more thorough and you being a bit more bored. Yeah, and, and that was my next question. How much does it cost? Does it cost extra if you have to come in more regularly? No, no. no. We're, at least that's correct. So that you're allowed two fully bulk tests for uh, visual fields on Medicare per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if we need to do further, at Specsavers at least, we will bulk do you under, under a subsequent item number. So mm. it will never cost you. The number of visual fields you need to do mm. to get the information we need will never cost you a cent, nor should it. Mm. 
I have another question. How does the ophthalmologist get the results of the visual field? And then also, why do sometimes they repeat it and you have to do another visual field when you go to the ophthalmologist? Most ophthalmologists, rightly so, are concerned about comparing like with like. So they're going to do um, a baseline visual field on their own machine, which might be a different brand. There are gold standard machines and they'll require the patient to give them a good baseline reading, especially after we've perhaps given them one or two mm -hmm. practices. Remember, we spoke about how their third test can often be the most accurate. So um, we will, when we send an electronic referral on, on our cloud-based system, we'll often attach our visual field results to that so that the ophthalmologist can see our area of concern. Mm -hmm. But um, almost all of them, I've found will do their own visual field on their own machine so that the statistics, every time they come back to the eye specialist, um, the statistics can be done on their machine and comparing like with like over the lifetime of their management. So mm -hmm. it's a good question, but you seem to be doubling up. Um, but in the end, they're in charge of the treatment regime often, and so um, they've got to be able to prove to their satisfaction and, and to um, you know, government satisfaction that they're tracking and monitoring yeah everything. exactly and hopefully in a collaborative care model if you've taken a pressure and it's not high or there's no and there's no um additional um, damage to the optic nerve then hopefully that can save the person an extra visit to the ophthalmologist and they can be managed uh competently with their optometrist and, and i have time. one or two who are you know, well known to and they'll happily allow you know us to the cost is a concern, they'll happily allow us um, to manage to a certain point mm. for um, referring back if needed, you know. Mm. You can have that collaborative yes. relationship which is wonderful. We totally support that. We have also discussed a technician might be doing the test. Is there a difference in the skill? Is it a fairly simple skill of the operator that it wouldn't matter if it's a technician, the optometrist or the ophthalmologist or an orthoptist? Uh, it is fairly straightforward from a technical perspective that the patient should feel confident in the person yeah. doing the test. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I know we train our techs to understand why they're doing the test and, and the importance of, you know, there's one point where you have to put an extra lens or two in front of the eye that's been tested to simulate the person's glasses. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't be letting, you know, technicians do this unless they're brought up to speed on why they're doing it mm. and the, the manner in which it should repeatedly be done. That being said, it is a, 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 a simple, if you do it properly, it, it's a simple, regular process. What is important is that the optometrist or the ophthalmologist does the interpretation. You'll never, um, you'll never find us getting a technician to do someone's pressures or their fields yes. and uh, telling the patient what the results are and what they think about it. That's, you know, that's not the way, that's not what we're doing, that's not the way it works. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll basically go through to the darkened room with the tech and then the information comes back on my door and we have another discussion about the yeah. results and the findings. That's just about efficient use of time. Exactly, you know? exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah. the, the professional scope of practice for those different roles, uh, definitely. I have a very good question here. When you've going to got glaucoma in one eye, why do you also have to do the visual field for both eyes? Why can't you just do it for the eye that has glaucoma? Well, there's a very high chance that the other eye can, depending on whether the glaucoma in the eye that does have it is the result of injury, which is a much rarer type, but um, there's a good chance that the other eye will start to go down the same road, having the same genetics, um, and so if they can get good baseline readings on the eye that hasn't been diagnosed yet and quickly get on to, you know, when it does start to lose any vision and start treatment much earlier, then you, know, you don't just, you don't treat an eye, you treat a person. Mm. And so, you know, this eye has glaucoma, um, but it doesn't come in on its own for a test. Mm. And so you, you don't, if, even if someone's got a red eye, Mm. or once a diagnosis you know has a foreign body i always check the other eye because mm. it could be an underlying condition that's manifesting as feeling like a foreign body yeah brilliant so you should it, it, it's lax if you're not testing the other eye so it, it doesn't mean you've got to put drops in both eyes if 
one's been diagnosed with glaucoma, a surgeon might, uh, an eye surgeon might do drops in one eye, not the other, for quite a period of time. Mm-hmm. But you should monitor carefully the visual field and the performance. Remember, we're talking about function mm-hmm. again here. So monitor the function of both eyes, and you're treating the patient as a whole. Okay. And another question that's come in is, well, why don't they test both at the same time? Why do you have to do one eye and then the other eye? Wouldn't it be easier to do it both at the same time? Great question. <laughs> because, you know, um, as I heard someone say that you can go and just test your chart um, to get your driver's license with both eyes open. Mm-hmm. But the problem is a lot of the, if you think of your visual field of the region, uh, which is not quite 180 mm-hmm. degrees, a lot of it overlaps the right and left eye. So mm. if you're trying to just test both eyes at once, you, there's areas you can't, you'll, you'll shine a light and if there's a gap in the left eye's vision, the right eye will see it and report it. So you're not picking up the gap in the left eye's vision. So you must, you must isolate the eye that's been tested yes. and test its full field on its own before isolating the other eye. Mm. That's so important. I mean, mm. it's useless information if you don't. Because all that area of overlap, you're going to sit there hitting your button. Yes. While lights are being flashed in what is potentially a blind spot you want to be mm. right. So the test that can't be done. The same when I give people a little macular chart. Monitor the macular on the fridge. Mm. Make sure you don't just go and stare at it. Yeah. Because one eye will fill in, just like with our little blind spot we talked about before. One eye will fill in what the other eye is missing and you don't get any mm. I think that's such an interesting answer and it makes sense, doesn't it, for those who are listening in. That is exactly right. I wouldn't know, you know, if my eyes were compensating for one or another and that's exactly why we have these tests so that they can see what the naked eye can't see. And so our cl- brain is so clever too that it, it does it tries to fill in the gaps, doesn't it? And so these, yeah. these tests are done deliberately to stop your brain doing that and so it can isolate. And, and then another reason would be that you, you should be looking straight ahead for the test. So um, if you're looking with both eyes, you're looking inwards at the same point. So mm-hmm. you want to isolate one eye and have it look straight ahead while you test the whole visual field and then isolate the other ah. eye. Slightly, right? Not both eyes have been slightly inwards so that they point at the same thing. Exactly. Um, so yeah, you just wouldn't do it. But it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's these are the questions repeated. our patients have. Here's another one for you, Matt. What is the lens that is inserted in the machine when when this person does the test? Why can't I wear my everyday multifocal glasses? So you're doing the test. For those who have not done a visual field, you're looking into a very dim bowl that sits in front of your eye. Okay, so if you imagine you've got your chin on the chin rest and one eye covered, your eye is staring at the dead center of this of this grey bowl. Every point on that bowl is the same distance from your eye. Mm. All right, and so if you basically got a set focal length that your eye is from from the testing surface, so there's only one prescription that is required at that focal length, and that's normally close to your reading glasses right. 30 or 40 centimetres. So you're not going to put your multifocals on and spend the whole test making sure you use the bit that's <laughs> not going to line up with, you know, the yes. peripheral vision on the multifocals is often distorted. Mm-hmm. So your appreciation of what we're testing peripheral vision. Yeah. Right? So, so you want a single lens or a, a double up lens that wrecks all of your vision for one particular focal length. Mm. And that's why we carefully you know, measure what needs to go in that little holder. Mm. And it'll be often vastly different. Yeah. The right and left eye. You know, so you've got a, you're tailoring the test to, once again, each eye's mm. requirement. Fabulous. Here's a question. I try not to blink during the test just in case I miss a spot. Is that correct? My eyes get very watery, though, when I try to do this. Common problem, yeah. You don't need to stop blinking. Remembering what we, we said before, it comes back to each point a number of times and checks that you miss it. That being said, a blink is um, is not a very uh, long duration and you'll find it, the um, likelihood that a blink coincides exactly with the short duration of the light mm. is, is not that likely. So blink away, we're much, much more concerned that you blink and keep a clean, clear ocular surface 
to do the test through. Mm. Well, you don't want watery eyes that are giving you um, starry vision or dry eyes that are a bit frosty or you, you should be blinking so that your eyes are between naturally at all times throughout the test and we'll deal with the odd chance that you know, a blink overlaps. You know, that's why the test rechecks everything all the time. So yeah. blink away. <laughs> I think that's really reassuring to our patients because that's exactly right. These are the stressful things. You said, you know, this idea of even it being a test, you know, it, it is testing what yeah, you're doing, but yeah, it's not yeah. an exam. It's not as if you've got to be, oh, my gosh, what if I miss one? I think by, by what you're saying is, you know, just get yourself comfortable as, as much as possible, relax, just be normal, act normally, uh, blink when you need to blink, don't let yourself eyes get, t- you know, sore and tired and and, um, and stressed, just go through it. And then I think that will end up getting a better result than when you concentrate. I'm hearing if you overthink it, it's not as good. Exactly. And right? ask for a pause if you need a pause and you find it difficult. Mm. That, that's so important. Don't overthink it. I try... You know, I said about the importance of the technician giving the right instructions. That's That needs to be done. Mm. But from my part, as I decide from the information I've gathered that I'm going to request the visual field, from my part, I, I downplay it very much. I like, let's go and do an extra test in mm. the dark room out the back. I just want to have a quick check it, you know, check the vision and, and um, compare it to where it should be. And I'll have a look at that when you're done. But uh, just remember to look straight ahead of much as you can throughout it and the importance of you know, not worrying about what you're doing. Just listen to the instructions. So if you downplay, you're not downplaying the importance of the test, mm. but you're downplaying the, uh, you know, the apprehension of what the underlying mm. um, what the patient concerned. Because I've already heard the word for coma and the, oh, hang on, that half the mix that up with macular degeneration. <laughs> so they think they're immediately going blind. So the importance is to downplay it so you get a good performance out of them and they're relaxed when they're doing it. Fantastic. Well, we don't have any more questions. If anyone's got a last minute question, make sure you type it in now. Otherwise, I will uh, thank Matt so much. He's come all the way from Hobart to share with us tonight after work. So we really appreciate the time that you've taken, Matt, and to make it sound so clear, you know, which is what we want. We just want to re- yeah. reduce our anxiety, make sure yeah. that we understand every aspect of the test and whether we like them or not, they are important and uh, it's all done for a reason and pretty much just trust the practitioner that they're all doing the right thing for you. And, and just ask if there's something you can do it, you know, mm. just ask. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, the time that you've given today. And also for all of our patients in Glaucoma Week, well done you for giving up your time uh, to come and listen. We have these five Facebook Lives going all week. We have one or two every day this week for Glaucoma Week. If any of you have missed a bit, you might have just come in a little bit late. It's okay. You can watch them. You can catch up. You can just press the play button afterwards or even tomorrow uh, so you won't miss anything. If you think a friend or someone you know in the Facebook groups missed it, that's okay. Just come back and watch it. And also, if you've got additional questions that pop up, just make sure that you send them to uh, via Facebook or the glaucoma email to our educator, Sapna. She'll be very happy to answer your questions. All right.